uh, PRS for Music is, a, is an overview for PRS and MCPS. They're two separate collection societies uh, that, that operate together under one brand named PRS for Music. They represent basically 124,000 songwriter, composers and music members across the world. So it's with my pleasure to uh, introduce Jatanil from PRS for Music. Good evening, Jatanil. Good evening. Good evening, Chris. Thank you very much for having me. Thank Super. You so, uh, Jatanil, uh, what's your what's your role at PRS? What is, what is exactly you do for for PRS for Music? So I I work in the membership department. So um, I kind of deal with our members, whether it is writers or publishers. Um, so my designation is relationship manager. So I I kind of make sure that our members are happy with uh, with PRS. Uh, and also whatever they require from our end to become the bridge between our members and the company. Um, so that's primarily what I do uh, at PRS. Brilliant. And for those that don't know already, what, what is PRS for Music? What does it actually do? So PRS for Music, um, as you very, very correctly put together, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a brand name uh, of which kind of... Um, encompasses two companies, Performing Rights Society PRS and Mechanical Copyright Protection Society MCPS. So PRS, um, the company PRS, Performing Rights Society is essentially a licensing body um, who would license the music um, on behalf of songwriters, on behalf of publishers um, to businesses. So whenever any, any music has been played outside of the domestic environment, a license is required in order to play the music, perform the music. Um, PRS essentially issues those licenses on behalf of songwriters and publishers, and then pay that money back to, to the songwriters and publishers as royalties, performing royalties. That's the primary function of PRS. Cool. And how far does uh, the collection of, 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 of royalties for PRS disclose itself? I mean, is it every time someone plays outside? Is it every time someone plays in a shop, in a bar? How far does it extend in terms of when someone could collect some royalties for their song? Well, you know, uh, everywhere, wherever you can listen music, if you can listen to, to, to the sound of music, there is a license that probably is in place basically. So right from streaming, when you are kind of streaming music on online, to the point where a salon, uh, you are you know, having your haircut, which uh, unfortunately is difficult these days. Um, it's all shut down. Um, but if there's music being played, that shop has been licensed by PRS. So it's a massively wide range of usages that gets licensed by PRS, TV, radio, all of that. And just to sort of maybe because it curiously comes into my mind, two sort of yeah. questions yeah. is what if someone is busking or something like that? Is there any anything attached to that? And the other question, whilst I kind of think of it, is what if someone does an open mic night at a bar as well? What what's that? What does that entail? Those sort at that end as well? Is there some money to be had for that? Sure. Yes. In principle, yes, there is um, there is money that goes back to the songwriters from the performances. So. Uh, busking as well as performing in a small venue or a pub is cl you know classed under uh, public performance. Um, so so whenever somebody is performing, say for example in case of busking, um, we would we would have already agreed a license um, between TFL and ourselves, even local authorities, wherever there are busking spots, and whoever whoever owns that busking spot. Uh, or manages that busking spot, uh, pays us license. Um, so that money goes back. Um, similarly, uh, small pubs uh, also um, buys license from us. They need to take a, a license which is annually renewed. Uh, so that money also goes back to the songwriters as their royalties. Um, the only important point over here is whoever is busking or whoever is performing, if it is their song, um, Ideally, they should really send a report to us. You know, you can do it online if you're a member. Um, now, if you're just a performer, uh, I think it is ethical uh, 
uh, to report to PRS about the tracks that you have performed so that the uh, respective songwriters and the publishers get paid. Well, that's that, that's brilliant already. That's a, a bit, bit of a nugget I didn't know about. So that's really mm -hmm. good. And obviously anyone that's uh, even thought about busking, maybe it might be a cold, wet day and they only get a few quid. Um, certainly a bit of a top up there. So, um, so basically, when and why should an artist, and I say an artist, a songwriter join PRS? At what point should they do that? So um, the, the thing that I, that I always <clears throat> tell uh, to all um, artists is, the moment you have started performing your track, performing performing your music, I think that's the point you should really think of joining because um, it, it starts generating money right from the point where the music is out there, whether it is in the form of digital distribution, so you put out on Apple, Spotify, anywhere else, or you are actually performing in front of the public, it's, it's, it's generating money. So the moment you have managed to take the music out of your computer and put it out there, that's the point when you should think of joining a performing rights organization. Okay. And obviously at the moment where it's quite relevant, where a lot of the venues are obviously closed or temporarily closed last year. Yeah. If, if for example, a venue paid their, their license fee to PRS, if it was, say, shut uh, half the year, how does that work? Does that then get paid each of the person performing a song get double the amount or does it get put in a reserve account? How does that work in terms of a year that's just unprecedented what we just had? Sure, sure. No, this is a very, very unusual circumstance, actually. Um, uh, I personally am not aware of the exact, um, I would say, details on uh, the this, this special situation now at the moment. I can actually get back to you uh, with an answer like what so people who the organizations or, or venues who would have already paid us um, what happens to the money that they have paid us uh, but I don't have an answer immediately Forty one there for you sorry um, <laughs> no 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 problem good question um, though I guess, I guess I guess maybe some venues maybe discounted that or maybe they've allocated a different ways. So it'd be interesting to yeah. know. Yeah, of course, of course. Yes, yes. No, no problem. And, and so for an artist, um, you know, how much does it cost and how does it work? Because there is a cost implication, but in the yeah. same respects, you know, perhaps you can explain how that all operates. Sure. So um, first I'll mention about the cost and then I would I would I would tell you my take on, you know, uh, the whole cost aspect of joining uh, a performing rights organization. So with PRS, uh, as a writer, when you join, you pay a one-time admission fee of £100. And that's just a one-time fee. Similarly, if you are joining MCPS as a writer, you pay £100. So each society admission fee is £100 each, basically. Um, so that's the cost. Um, if somebody is kind of starting a publishing company um, and they want to kind of publish other writers. So the joining fee of publisher for PRS and MCPS is 400 pounds each of them, basically. So that's the joining fee. Now, I absolutely appreciate the fact that when somebody is starting out, especially um, artists, they may not have that amount of money spare to kind of um, spend and join. Um, so in, with that in mind, uh, the, what, what I normally would kind of look at it, if I am in that position where I don't have the money and I need to really work hard to get that money, is think about it as an investment. So when you start a business, because as a songwriter, you are actually in business. Um, it's your own business. Um, and in order for you to kind of progress in your business, you have to make certain investments. And I look at uh, this cost, which PRS um, joining fee as an investment for, for any songwriter, which obviously will, you know, give back a lot more. Um, say, for example, roughly, I, I can say like a, uh, two plays in Radio 1 probably give, give the money back or, you know, some some performances and pubs will roughly give the money back 10 to 15 performances if you are regularly performing that money will come back to you so 
it's a kind of a wiser investment to make. A long-winded answer, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And um, without sounding too pedantic in terms of, uh, you, you know, the way to help people to understand how it kind of works. Sure. Um, you see quite a few people, especially where, where, where I'm from in Southampton, will, will often mm. open mic hop and they do like two or three open mic nights in a night is is that a, a, a strategy not necessarily one for winning fans over i would say but is that a strategy whereby they could get paid each pub they played at and and what would be the amount roughly technically yes um uh, the average per night uh, amount that gets allocated for for a very small pub performance is roughly eight to nine pounds so if you are if you are the only person performing or if you are the only band performing essentially that nine pound belongs to you provided all the songs is your songs um if it is more than one band performing obviously that gets proportionately split split between the bands but technically when you are performing in pubs you are actually earning money and and and, and let's be honest that's obviously at the lower end of the spectrum of the pay sure. but i guess if you typically had say 10 people performing open mic night it could be a pound at a time so mm. you know but in over the course of the year you know if you did go out a couple of times a week that could be 100 quid then plus your radio then plus sure. your other festivals and bits and pieces yeah absolutely absolutely brilliant so what yeah okay I, I, we might have crossed over with this one but at what point does an artist st start to earn money from prs at what point does it start to come in in, in the bank account so um the moment you start performing, um, let's just take example of live performance. Um, say if you're performing in a in a very small venue or a pub, and if you if you are if you are aware that the pub is licensed by PRS, um, or if not if it even if it is not licensed by PRS, I'll cover that bit. Um, you you essentially can earn the amount of money that I just mentioned. Um, what happens is that money gets accumulated in your account when you open an account with PRS as, as, a, as a writer. The moment it hits 30 pounds, you get paid. So you, so the amount of money accumulated in your account, if it you know, reaches 30 pounds and above, you start getting paid, basically. Cool. And what would be the reason for maybe any potential delays in that? That uh, you, you, you know, um, would there be anything to stop that from happening? Is is there, you know, maybe yeah. writers anything that can kind of hinder that? Yeah. So um, what happens is when you join PRS or you know when you join any performing rights organisation, you have to register um, the information, the details of your track that you're you're going to be performing. You may not have made an audio recordings, even if you are performing it live, just to test out the audience and their reactions, essentially it's of public performance. So you should be registering the work because when a reporting comes, usage reporting gets reported to us, we need to see the metadata. We need to see the information about the track uh, into our system, which happens when you register the track with us. That may be one reason why payment may get delayed because we may not find the track being registered in our system. Yeah. That's one reason. The second reason can be there may be a delay with receiving the license fee. Um, so venue may, venue may have agreed to a license, but we may not have received the money from the venue. That is another reason. So this happens with a lot of broadcasters where the broadcasters would agree um, to, the, to, the, to the license fee but there may be some delay with receiving the payment. That's, some, that, that's a kind of a reason why it may be delayed. The third reason why you may have a delay in your, um, in your payment may be because of there are some issues with the bank details. You know, um, That's another reason that can be possible. And um, what else? What are the other reasons? Um, these are the three things I can think of at this point. Um, for a particular delay, and if the threshold is not reached, basically. So going going back a little bit off point now, a little bit. Sure. I remember when I first started doing events, there used to be 
situations where we used to get someone coming down logging all the tracks getting done yeah uh, you, hopefully you remember, remember that or may not remember <laughs> that too yeah now obviously that doesn't seem to happen anymore and i forget in covid and things so how do they collate the, the the track listings from live performances now how's that done i get the digital and i get the radio but how does that mm -hmm. work for live performance nowadays so we still have the um physical forms which you can fill in and send it to us, or um, you can do it on an Excel spreadsheet and email it to us. But the best way of doing this is using our online, on, on, on our website, when you, when you have your online account, you can actually submit set lists from your account. So you can actually choose a venue, you can choose all the tracks that you have already registered, put the duration in and then submit it. Um, so that's the easiest way to submit that gets I immediately ingested into the system. So pretty much you're relying on the, the, the artist songwriter doing that now. I suppose what I was uh, referring to is when you used to rely on the promoters and the venues doing that. And that we, was, yeah. we do still we do still um, in some instances rely on the promoters or the venue, even the venue uh, to ensure they send us uh, the details. So the, when the venue send us the details, either it will be an email or it can be a paper form. That's that's still there. It does exist. And I guess that's a kind of cross-checking of the two informations to, yeah. to see the data. Okay, that's cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just just obviously for some people, what is the main differences between, in simple terms, of, between PRS and MCPS, which we described at the start? Hmm. Sure. So um, in order to explain the difference, I'm just going to very very briefly touch on what copyright is because. That's the bit, that's how we would be able to understand the difference. So when you have an idea in mind, that idea cannot be protected in any legal form. So in, in any legal system in the world cannot protect an idea that you have in your mind. In order to have protection of your idea, you have to express that idea. The expression of that idea can be protected in, in the legal system. The protection provided for an expression of an idea is known as copyright, actually. So that copyright um, has two kinds of rights, if we kind of broadly categorize them. One is the economic rights, and the other one is the moral rights. We're, we're not going to deal with about the moral rights, but we're just talking about the economic rights because PRS, MCPS, all of this is basically a place from where you earn revenue from, from, from the intellectual property that you create. So. In copyright, the economic right is basically a bundle of five different rights. The right of reproduction, right to reproduce or right to copy, as you would say, right to distribute, right to public performance, right to adaptation or derivative work, and right to display. Um, because music has nothing to do with display. It's primarily for paintings or photographs or things like that. We would, we, we'll be concerned only of this four uh, rights, which is reproduction right, distribution right, performing rights, and adaptation rights. Now, performing rights is what covered by PRS. So your performing rights is licensed by PRS for music. Uh, sorry, PRS. Now, the right to reproduce or the right to copy is what mechanical license or mechanical rights essentially is. So what happens when you are... Um, when you are uploading your track onto Spotify, if I am listening to your music, what I am essentially doing is my device, it's, whether it is a phone or the computer, is temporarily copying that file from Spotify's cloud into my device. So what is happening? There are two things happening. I'm listening to it, which is performing rights being exercised. And I'm actually copying the file into my computer in order to listen to it. So in order to copy the file, I need permission from the owner of the copyright, which is you. Therefore, in order for me to go to you, I would need your details. So make, to make the thing simple, you become a member of MCPS and MCPS issues and license. So we, I don't really don't need to do anything. Spotify would pay MCPS in order to exercise that right, basically. So mechanical right essentially is the right to copy. Being a copyright owner, you have the right to allow anybody to copy your music, anybody to distribute your music, anybody to perform your music, and anybody to adapt your music and make any derivative work. So MCPS does that. 
mechanical that, that, that was really well explained thank you that's really good so if controversial question mm -hmm. you've only got 100 pounds which one would you go for first prs or mcps um it's very difficult because if if primarily say for example if your music is essentially in the online domain and you are not really performing you are just creating music and putting it out out there i think it is important that you join both because there is an element of mechanical royalties that you would miss out on if 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 that is not covered you know but if you are a performing musician maybe you can go for the prs first um you know uh, but out of the prs and mcps it is always important to join prs first um because everywhere the music is there they will have to pay the performing royalties uh, and that's basically the bulk of the money that you receive so we we talked uh, briefly a little bit about ppl i think you said you wanted to mention that yes where does that fit in amongst what, how you just explained things sure sure so uh, going back to my copyright explanation you know um your expression is being protected by copyright now once you have done the expression so, so you have you have composed a song you have written a song so that's the expression the expression is uh, a literary and musical expression so words and music together so that's the expression which is protected by copyright however it has to reach out to the public okay so you need to convert that expression into some form okay and the popular form the most popular form is the audio form so when you convert the expression into an audio recording audio format that format also has its own copyright so the moment you have composed a song written a song and you have recorded it you have essentially created two sets of copyright copyright of the song which is the music and the lyrics and the copyright of the sound recording so for it, for the sound recording when when say for example the the, the music is played in a radio the radio can only play the music because the sound recording exists so essentially radio is using two copyrights the sound recording copyright as well as the copyright of the song therefore the radio station will pay a license fee to prs mcps and also to ppl so your sound recording also would generate income for you from public performances so wherever a sound recording has been played you receive money means royalties as the performer as the recording owner so does ppl come under prs for music or is that a completely separate organization so that's ppl is a separate organization it's called phonographic performance limited um and they solely deal with public performances or performing royalties of sound recordings and in, and in simple terms that's when people come into artists come into difficulties going to in recording studios and the recording studio is then asking them about rights and things like with licensing is that the way that that element of the copyright comes in i i don't i don't understand okay, if you explain me this a little bit about the recording studio quite, quite often when you have artists they will sort of often say about um you know the rights to the song who owns the rights to the song Mm -hmm. Is the recording studio basically arguing about that element of the song? Okay, so yeah, so when you are so essentially, you know, the question is, uh, who owns the sound recording? Okay, now a lot of the time, um, a, a recording studio, if they are not charging any money or maybe you know charging very very minimum amount of money, may also say, well, you know, you can compensate us by. giving us a stake in the sound recording um so they wouldn't they may not be uh you know asking um a part in the song but because the sound recording happens um there and their resources are used to make the sound recording it is possible that they may say well this is our condition we need to kind of own the sound recording or part own the sound recording that's possible
so, so I guess that's where a lot of the, the artists we work for just need to be careful and aware of that when they're working with someone who says they will do stuff for free, that actually yeah. there's that little element that perhaps needs to be discussed or worked out. Is that Absolutely. I think where, wherever, whenever um, uh, an independent artist or songwriter, singer-songwriter, you know, um, they are doing everything on their own. They are putting the money, uh, you know, they are asking favours, whatever, you know, whatever way. They're making it happen for themselves. Um, essentially, they should try and keep the ownership of the copyright in the song and the sound recording as much as possible to themselves. Cool. OK, so there is another organisation that, that's uh, talked about, and I'd, I'd like to see how that fits in and your, your take on that. Sure. So also pay to be a member of Centric. And what do you understand with that and how that fits in with with the whole setup of all these organisations? Sure. Sure. So um, Centric is not a collection society. Centric is a publisher. Um, so anybody can open a company and, you know, do what Centric does as a publisher. You know, obviously there will be difference in the infrastructure. They may have more manpower. They may have more networks. But essentially what they does is what any publisher would do. So, um what happens is when when you become i don't know if i should call it as you know member of centric or maybe they have started um a membership of centric that's possible but that doesn't mean that centric can go and license bbc on your behalf it has to be done the, the licensing activity happens through prs and mcps Centric being the publisher would register your music with PRS and MCPS and receives the money and then pay it to you. That's what happens. So in theory, you do not need a Centric to, to kind of collect the money. You can join PRS directly and collect the money yourself. Um, so instead of Centric, it can be any other publishing company who can do that. So uh, the only unique thing I can think of is probably whatever infrastructure they have, any kind of tracking system they have, any kind of um, set process they have established, which kind of works in order to track and collect royalties as much as possible is something that may be unique to them, but it is absolutely different from uh, a society. So just while we're talking about that in terms of them acting as publisher, Am yeah. I right in saying is uh, you, you said there was a one hundred pounds one off fee to join PRS, mm -hmm. but if you, for example, you know you collected a hundred pound for that artist, do you then take a percentage of that hundred pound that you pay each artist as well, or is that hundred pound kind of cover it all? How does that work? Um, so um, that hundred pounds is to cover the cost of infrastructure and manpower that we put in process, processing the application. Um, but in addition to that, when we are distributing or collecting royalties, there is a separate percentage administration cost that gets deducted from different various sources, which we publish on our, on our website. So um, that money that you pay hundred pounds is just to kind of help us process the, um, co cover the cost of, processing the application so the percentage would vary according to what you collected and for what, what yeah what, it was yeah TV, radio whatever tv radio all of that has got slightly different administration percentages that gets deducted and then the final amount gets passed on to you so yeah. average our, our average percentage uh, administration cost is around 11 point some 11.8 to 11 percent roughly we are one of the very lowest uh, admin um societies yeah, across the globe actually um, so does every country have a prs room or is there some countries that just don't have a prs or like society that collects uh, the, the the rights for people well um the truth is not every country has it but most of them have so there are roughly 150 uh, performing rights organization across the globe um you know every country has some countries have more than one societies, uh, collection societies, like US has three performing rights organization, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. So um, it varies from country to country, but every country has 
uh, our collection society some sort so it probably leads me on to my next question is it, which yeah. is what if your dual nationality or you know you're thinking of going abroad you, you know what what's best is it best they join prs and the country they originate from or the country they're going to what what's your advice on that um i think um my answer to that question is it really is subjective and i I'll, I'll explain why i say that so for example if 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 there is a person who who is from us but they're based in the uk um now depending upon there is one way of looking at it depending upon where you res, where your income is generated more whichever country it is you can actually take the membership of the local performing rights organization there because that's that's the country that you are getting more maximum amount of revenue from or you can decide to split the membership so you can be member of prs for certain territories and you can also become a member of another society for the rest of the world that's also possible or if you are residing in a particular country you may want to join the society of that country so these are this can be the three kind of broad scenarios where you can choose to join a particular society um but there are a lot of lot of people who are member of prs for the world although they reside in a different country altogether purely because the transparency of the society the efficiency um how efficient they are collecting money on behalf of our writers um so these are also certain factors that can actually you know help you decide which society to join so i've got a couple more questions before we open it up so maybe people that are listening they've got some questions lewis is going to collect a few of those to hopefully not give too many banana skins to you jess and <laughs> I, I think at this moment in time um you, you know um it's very difficult for artists they can't get out there whether it's through busking whether it's through live performances which so many rely on that as an income source yeah. what, what funding is available for artists from from a prs point of view um so prs don't have a funding of its own but we had set up 15 years back we had set up a foundation a charity uh, which is which is kind of as part of prs in in a, in a way prs foundation where there are different categories of funding which is available from for all kind all levels um of artists basically so there are several programs one of the most popular program is the open fund where um um uh, an artist can apply for up to a maximum of 5000 pounds um once a year uh, basically application it is it is open three times a year but you know um the eligibility uh, says that you can only apply once but that's one pot of money that you can apply for prs foundation also has a, has a similar uh, kind of uh, grant uh, funding uh, pot which is called women in music which is kind of specifically um you know for women artists um female composers you know creators then the other very popular one is known as momentum uh, fund which is um which is a pot of money where ppl also contributes uh, and that is for um artists who have who have got some success and they just need that bit of a push to kind of take it to the next level uh you can apply for up to um i think it is up to 15k uh, but it's all kind of there on on a, on on their website um how much you can apply uh, please don't quote me on this because i think i'm not sure about the exact amount but you know either either it is 10 or 15k um and the other one which is for the producers who are who are actually not the artists or not the songwriters it's called the hitmaker fund which is for music producers uh or composers who are working with other artists um that's another very popular one so it's just example of few of these um um uh, we have in prs foundation that you can apply for 
Okay, I think Lewis, we've got an article we can share that with everyone in the chat, which is which is some further reading from today. We don't obviously have time to go into specifics, but the PRS Foundation Open Fund. What I mean is that for anyone that's just worked on one gig, or is there a, a, is there a criteria for that, or or is it best they look it up maybe after today if it's too complicated? No, the uh, the thing is, um, it's fairly open. The name. <laughs> Is open fund. It's it's very open, and you know pretty much all levels of artists can apply. Um, but I think the the important factor is um, somebody has to be practicing um, or probably in music for at least a year, year and a half. You have to kind of demonstrate that you know you are you are you are um, in music for 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 a bit of time. But honestly, I have seen very first time uh, songwriters, they have also been funded by Open Open Music Fund. I think the good thing about PRS Foundation is they they give emphasis on the quality of music on, you know, if your music is really good, um, everything else, you know, doesn't make a um, bigger impact in terms of the decision, they probably will fund you for your work. Excellent. And so is there any other activities PRS has in, uh, evolved in? Anything else that we should, we've missed or could expand on, do you think? Or do you think we've covered most of the, the general? I think I think we've covered most of it, but um, there is um, a, a members fund also, which is kind of for music, for, for our members who, because of any reason, either because of old age or because of an accident, they are not able to kind of do their you know, day-to-day -day creative work, and that kind of has an impact on their income, especially during this time when, you know, people were completely paralyzed by not able to go and perform because probably a major chunk of the money they earn is by performing live. Uh, so members fund would kind of help in the situation um, and, you know, support for for living costs and all of that. So that is something that I think people should, no brilliant um so before we go to the questions i've got one question which might be a fact or a myth i'd like to know sure, sure. <laughs> it's a couple of years back did prs accidentally pay everyone a couple of extra noughts is that was that a fact or a myth i always kind of hear that around um there was some uh there was a kind of a overpayment made um uh, it, back in 2018 2017 2018 yes it did happen and because of that um well, i have had to speak to a few members where we had to ask them if they can pay the money back um and it was a mistake and it did happen yes did a few people get fired there just <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know about that <laughs> well we'll leave that one <laughs> better not go on camera for that well brilliant that's that's been really in, you know informative it's been a good to sort of catch up with that um lewis have we got some some quick i see loads of questions coming it'd be great to see what we've come up with really sure so i've been answering them as as they've kind of come in so i've tried to field a few um, I think one of the main ones, and especially relevant to this year, would be um, can an artist collect royalties from Facebook or social media streams, live streams? Um, uh, live streams is slightly tricky, but yes, Facebook, you can. So any of the platforms that has already been licensed, say YouTube, Facebook, um, uh, yes, you can, in theory. Um, but depending upon uh, the usage reporting that we get, that's one. And secondly, there may be delay in terms of processing because uh, when we receive the usage information, there are you know billions of lines of data which needs processing. So there may be a delay, but in 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 principle, yes, you can receive. And, and where you reference usage information, is that the interactions or plays that kind of happen on the stream? Uh, yeah, that's that, and also the platform needs to report it to us. Um, uh, you know. Uh, the, the usage sure cool um a few we've been having is is a few questions are around centric and other organizations and, and it seems like one of the advantages obviously if they're saying they can collect royalties from european countries and and you know us and wherever else mm -hmm. how does an artist a uk-based artist um collect royalties from the states or a european country 
So, um, uh, like I mentioned, there are more than 150 societies, um, and each and every society has reciprocal agreements. So, PRS has reciprocal agreements with pretty much all the societies uh, in the world, most of them. And be because of the reciprocal agreement, uh, our members' money can be collected from pretty much globally through that network. So that's how it works. Fantastic, that's good. Um, I, I think we've covered most of the questions in the group. Um, how does P I just have one comment. How does PRS actually work in terms of recognizing songs? Um, do you have to embed some sort of code into the song file? So you literally just fill out a form of the song's name, the band, sorry. Do you fill out a form on the song's name, band name, and length? So I suppose it's a couple of questions there. Obviously, when you release through a distributor, you don't need to worry about, um, you know, kind of PRS recognizing your songs because that's set up through, you've got connections, I'm assuming, with Spotify and, and Google Play and things like that. So that will kind of collect the royalties there. Is that correct? Yeah, um, yeah. so um, um, there are a couple of more points over here. One is what I was talking about registration, that regardless of the fact that you have distributed the song means the audio of it, um, you would still need to kind of register the song with PRS. So when you become a member, you get access to the online portal. You just put the information in the song title, the duration of the song, that I mean, the length of the, of the song and who has been, who has contributed in the song, if there is any publisher, all of that information, share splits, percentages, etc. So that's the metadata, that's the information about the song. Um, we have a third uh, party organization. So we have got, uh, uh, we work with uh, with an organization called Sound Mouse. They are, they are audio fingerprinting, uh, they have audio fingerprinting technology and we use them to track usages as well. So as a member, you get free access to their services. That means you can upload your audio to SoundMouse and SoundMouse will fingerprint them and wherever it is played, they'll pick it up, you know, because sometimes what happens, platforms may miss out in, you know, sending us the usage information, uh, sending, us, sending us the performance information, but sound, SoundMouse will capture and we have done that in the past and we have managed to distribute way more royalties than we would have otherwise you know so that's the audio fingerprinting technology tracking side of things you know whereas the distributor uh, would make sure that every platform receives the audio track and it is available for the consumers or people to kind of listen to it you know um, so yeah that's basically the difference but yeah you don't have to, you are not, it is not compulsory to submit an audio track to PRS, but there is an option where you can send it to sound mouse so that they can fingerprint it. That's it, really helpful, thank you. Um, we've had it come, come up a couple of times where people have asked, uh, can you sign up, uh, can you claim for uh, or backdate payments prior to you joining PRS? And I'm assuming the answer is no, um, that you can't yeah. claim for. Yeah. Know, it, if you are if you are already if you are a member already, um, you can go back as far back as three years maximum, provided you were a member then, or if you are up to the point of your membership basically. So if you had joined in 2017, you probably could go back maximum of three years from now. But if you had joined 2019, you can go far as far back as 2019 to the point of joining. You know, in terms of claiming anything um, which you know has been performed but has not, you know, come through into the distribution and has not been paid. Sure. Just, can I just clarify something? So, yeah. say for example, I'm an artist and, um, you know, I've heard someone said, Oh, your track was played on Radio One last night, yeah. or maybe three months ago or six months ago, but yeah. I wasn't a member. Does that mean once that's played, bad luck or is is there some leeway that well i better get i better join now how does it work for someone who hasn't you know i get the bit about backdating if you already were but what if you weren't a member how can you backdate at all um so what happens is when you become a member when you when you apply to for membership um regardless of when the application comes in your effective date of membership can be either first of january or first of july depending upon which half you have applied for your membership. Therefore, 
if a track has been played within that six months period, you can you can expect the money to come to you. So there is a bit of a lag. So you have a window of six months, uh, you know, for collection. So, so anyone that wants to to hear the radio better get signed up quick. But what what is the best thing for them to to join PRS and and, and maybe, you know, if if it's all possible, reach out for you for any further questions, or are they better going for uh, the generic uh, emails? What what's best for people who aren't members already? If if somebody's not a member, um, I am happy to you know take questions, uh, whether they are member or not a member, you know. Um, so you can share my email address, no problem. Um, if there is a s- kind of a joining specific question, um, you can email to admissions at prsformusic.com. So that's that, that's an email where there is a team who would be able to answer um, uh, your queries. Any more questions come in, Lewis, or are we pretty much covered? I think we've covered an awful ground and a good overview as well. It's been really, really useful, I think. Any other questions, Lewis? We have got, we have got one. Um, further, further, so I'll try and go through this. So if you've released through a distributor, um, such as Able, um, is it better to keep your own ISRC codes or use the ones you embed into your masters? If you later re-release with the same songs with a different distributor, would you need to use different ISRC codes or the same ones? So um, it's a very good question, actually. Um, the ISRC code um, is very specific to a sound recording. You know, so it's called International Standard Recording Code. Um, if you are not a member of PPL, um, or if you you can still uh, request a code specific to you. And you can generate your own ISRC code. That way, you can be consistent, regardless of which distributor you use. Because distributor would allocate an ISRC code only if there is no ISRC code allocated to it. So it is always a good idea as an artist, if you're releasing your own music, <coughs> to have your own ISRC code. And it doesn't cost you any 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 money at all. You just request PPL that you are going to be releasing sound recordings, they will generate a code for you and you can use that for your, your own sound recordings. That would be my suggestion. Sure. Therefore, if you have an ISRC code allocated or as, you know uh, attached to it by a distributor in the past, you can, in theory, use the same ISRC code even if you move into to, to a different distributor. You do not need to you know, then again put another ISRC code for the same sound recording. Perfect. That's a really good answer. Really useful to know that as well. Um, I suppose one final one from me, um, if you can answer this, is if I were to apply for funding, have you got some tips or suggestions into what um, the PRS Foundation would be looking for in an artist? So um, 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 the most important thing to be, you know, uh, I would say is be very concise and Clear. A lot of the time, when you when you write an application uh, and you you're writing in paragraphs, you're kind of explaining, explaining, explaining. I would always suggest that make sure it is in bullet points, because imagine uh, an assessor is going through hundreds of applications. You know, they really want concise, precise, and very specific um, points mentioned there. Secondly, the place where most um, um, uh, applicants um, gets rejected is the budget section. And that's the, the most important part because whatever you are asking for and whatever you're earning needs to kind of add up to a point where it shows us. So it will ask you, what is, what is the total amount uh, uh, that is required for the project and how much you are asking PRS Foundation to pay? Now that amount needs to really match with the budget, you know. That's that's the second point. It's slightly technical, but the third and very very important point is: do not make the application in last minute. You generally get a month to apply. I would always suggest, you know, start early. Make sure there are one or two people 
who would read your application and just point out if there is something jumping out or if something is not quite right. It's very important to kind of give yourself time to write the application. I think these are the points I would suggest. Fantastic, really helpful with that. Very helpful. Uh, someone said, could you expand on, on the, the, the bit about the budget difference? So when you're, when you're doing your calculations, so, uh, um, so what happens is um, you have to specify uh, any budget will have expense and income, okay? So you will have some income that will come in and we'll have some expense that is go going to happen. Uh, in most of the cases, if you, are, if you are aware of the exact amount of income and exact amount of expenses, uh, what will happen is, so for example, you, your uh, project costs 10,000 pounds and you know that you will be able to earn 2000 pounds so your your effective cost is 8000 you know it makes sense so 10000 pound is the expense you are able to earn 2000 pounds that means your effective expense is 8000 and if you are asking say 5000 pound pound uh, as uh, as as a grant from prs foundation then your effective expense remains is 3,000 pounds. So because from 8,000, you deduct. So what I'm trying to say is all these points needs to kind of match up right at the end because there is a section where the total amount income expenditure, it needs to become zero. It needs to add up basically, you know? So that's what I mean. Uh, it's very difficult to explain, you know, just by saying because it's, there is a table there. But what I mean to say is you have to be extremely um, I would say um, uh, vigilant about the numbers that you're putting in and make sure that right at the end, it becomes zero. Sure. It, it, it is an automated calculation that happens, but it, it should become zero. Sure, no, fantastic, really helpful, thank you. Um, is, are there any more questions? I think with that, we, we've probably covered everything. Um, we've obviously got, we'll follow up with an email from today's session as well. Um, sure. If, like I said, we can pass on your contact details to everyone who's attended as well. Plus, we can give them some generic information or generic contact details if they'd like to get in touch about their current memberships or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. that's not at all a problem. And in fact, if you have you know any any further questions, you can maybe collect those questions and send it to me as well. I'll try and answer them uh, if that helps. Amazing. Well, thank, thank you very, very much, much Jason Neil. It's been really, really helpful. It's given it a good overview. I think some of the questions probed you a little bit further, which was good. But I think today was a bit of a, a touch space with, with what PRS was all about and MCPS. And hopefully there's some takeaways from that for some of the people that are on today that they can feel confident to join themselves if they're writing their own songs, you know, yeah. with busking and performing, you know, go out there as well. I think for the guys next week, we've got another uh, a masterclass with Nikki Black Market, who is not just a, a drum and bass and dance uh, pioneer producer, sells lots of vinyls, started Black Market Records. So again, uh, for those who want to do that, I think that uh, Lewis, we're certainly going to do a discount or a free code for that for next week. Lewis is going to send out some more material in terms of how you can get the funding from PRS and, uh, and obviously some more further reading. And um, for those of you that don't know about Mass Records, you know, they're taking applications for next year. Some of you can do a second year if you're of a certain age. And those of you who haven't done it before, then we'll give you the link to that and get involved with Mass Records. And we've also got a future music artist development course as well that I know some of you are on. So plenty of stuff to sort of obviously, um, you, you know, get further stuck in. You guys are obviously being proactive and come on these masterclasses. But firstly, thank you, Jetsonel. Big applause over for that. Thank you. Thank you. Stuff. Thank you very, very much. much. You know, appreciate and your I... time, that you, 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 <laughs> your, your valuable time. And thank you guys, all you guys coming obviously on a, on a very cold evening. Keep coming back next Wednesday. This is where you learn your, your profession. And this user, you guys are going to go be the people that are going to come on and, and be artists to be uh, we reckon with in future years. So thank you all of you. And we we'll we get the email out to you and we hope to see you again next week. So bye-bye. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.